I've been very interested really in working with Parkinson's disease uh, all of my career. And what most of us are working on are the movement component of the disease. We now know it's, it's much more multifactorial, but actually it's the movement that, that is one of the major problems. And uh, the movement's caused by the loss of the nerve cells sitting deep down here in, in the midbrain in a region called the substantia nigra. And they send their processes up to these other regions and release their dopamine, and that's what causes movement. And when it's when those cells are lost that all the movement problems come in Parkinson's patients. I've got a fantastic uh, collaborator, Paul Roach. He's a chemist and an engineer. So we teamed up a couple of years ago and said, you know, we don't have any good ways to model Parkinson's in a dish. It's really complicated to try and get nerve cells to connect in a dish in a meaningful way. So we're not really trying to rebuild the brain in a dish, but we are trying to rebuild the circuit that's involved in Parkinson's disease. So here it is. I left it del this slide deliberately complicated with lots of letters on it. So just to show that it is complicated. I told you about the one set of nerve cells that die in Parkinson's. They're the ones sitting here in pink. And you see they have connections. So what you've got here in the boxes is different regions of the brain in the circuit that, that they're involved in. You can see they're sitting in the center of this very complicated circuit with all these different regions. The arrows point uh, where the nerve cells talk to the next one down in the circuit. So that's the direction the, the information goes. And you can also see there's some green arrows and some red arrows. So some nerve cells excite other nerve cells further down, that's the green ones. Some nerve cells inhibit nerve cells further down, that's the red ones. So you can see it's a very complicated circuit. You've got some things switching things on, some things switching things off. And the dopamine nerve cells sitting right there in the middle. They're almost like the stop-go sign, if you like, at a, at a roadworks. They're, they're running the stop-go. So we, we wanted to try and recreate this in a dish. You can see probably right now why nobody's done it yet. We thought we'd go a little bit more simple. We, rather than pick, I think there's, eight, there's seven on there, aren't there? We'd, we'd only pick five regions. We thought we'd go down from seven to five. So, so we haven't got this region or this region represented, but we've got the other regions here represented. So Paul is very clever, and he can use engineering takes to uh, build polymers that, um, that make structures in plates. And we decided we would build this structure. So every color represents those five regions. You can see here they're color-coded. So we've got the big region here in the middle, that's the striatum, and that actually has two inputs, the yellow and the pink one, and there's our dopamine nerve cell sitting down here, and it has two outputs, the red and the green one. So that's what we tried to build. You have to make a little master template here. This is a bit like potato printing, if you like. We've got some fa fancy machines that will make these templates. You can see a person's hand there. That's Munya, who's the postdoc who's been employed on the project. So you can see how big this is. That's a, that's a uh, Petri dish that you used to grow cells in. So it's about 10 centimeters across. So you can see you can fit five of these on a 10 centimeter diameter plate. So we're quite small. And here, they're on a microscope slide here. This is one, one device sitting on a microscope slide. It's called a microfluidic device because it has fluids in it and they can flow. You can see they can flow in the sections. And we just colored that one with food coloring. So you can see all the different sections are different colors. And those sections are discrete. You can see the food coloring is, is not mixing. It's all distinct colors. So they're all separated out in the majority. But there's something very interesting happening down the gaps. Down in those regions where that's black, there are some tiny, tiny micro channels. They're about as big wide as about a tenth of a hair a tenth of a hair's width, so they're tiny, tiny. We've made them too small for the cells to go through, so the cells can't cross the barrier, but they're big enough so their cells' processes can grow through. So that's what, what we've designed. And you can see here, so we can put cells in this compartment and they'll grow processes through. We can put cells in this compartment and they can grow processes through. And the idea is they will connect up with the cells. So what we'll have is a connected circuit where our regions are now still distinct, they're not mixed, but our, the processes can connect. And we've gone a step further. I think the next slide I've got. We've actually made these ch tiny channels tapered. So they're wide at one end, but much narrower at the other. And that, the idea is we want the processes to grow one way only. It's like a one-way street. If you, if you make one end narrow enough, the car can't fit down it. There's the cells sitting here. And we've labeled them with the fluorescent marker. And you can see all their processes coming out the other side and the channels are in the middle here. So it's definitely working, so we've got this to do. And this is another way of showing it. The cells are sitting here, and those are processes growing into those channels. 
So we can definitely connect things up. And the first evidence we've got, uh, we, we, want, what, we didn't just want to build a circuit, we want to build a circuit that functions, and actually we can measure the function of this circuit. So the first way we did that is to see were the cells active, and these are nerve cells, so they should be electrically active, and, and could we change things? So uh, what we did is we used calcium. Calcium's interesting, you, you all know about calcium. Cal cells like calcium a lot when it's in its very small form. They take it up, they spit it out, they use it a lot. And actually nerve cells use calcium a lot, so we can use that as a measure of whether they're active or not. Because when they're active, they have more calcium. When they're not active, they have less. So what we did is we measured a signal by having little cells fluorescing when they had calcium in them. And what, this, this is just one slide of very many experiments that, that Munya did. Is he had cells in, in all the ports, and he measured the calcium uh, amounts here. So you can see that there's a lot of calcium here, and then there's a drop. That drop happens is because he's put in a, in a, in a chemical that stopped those cells being excited. So when those cells aren't getting, uh, are getting blocked, they can't make a signal. So that's what he showed. He could do that in the cells in the individual areas, but actually the clever thing he did was he said, OK, I'm going to measure what happens with these cells, and here they're all active. That's the top lines here, this, this wibbly one here and this wiggly one here. And then I'm going to put the blocker in here. And that blocker molecule is too big, again, to get across the gap. So that blocker is only going to block the cells in here. And so if those cells are blocked, maybe the cells downstream will be blocked as well. And that's exactly what he saw. So when he blocked the cells in this part, that's the red line here, he actually got no signal out at the bottom from the cells downstream. So we know they're connected. They're talking to each other. So that's very, very exciting. So what we're doing really with this current project, and we've had a year's funding to get the prototype working, is to, what we're doing now is to check that the different types of cells really do connect in the right ways. Have we got the right part talking to the right part? And then the other thing we want to do, I told you the last slide about calcium measurements. We can actually measure electrical activities in our cells. We can grow our cells on a piece of glass, and that in that piece of glass we have very small electrodes, little electrical points, and we grow the cells on top of those that can actually measure electrical activity in our cells. And there's some fancy machines now that will let us do this and have a look at individual cells and what they're doing. So we're trying to combine the two, our technology with the, uh, the electrode technology, and it's called a multi-electrode array, or MEA. So that's where we're at at the moment. What we'd like to do in the future, hopefully this now brings all my projects sort of full circle. First of all, we'd like to damage cells specifically to make a proper model of Parkinson's in a dish. And we think that might be really useful to pharmaceutical industries and other researchers, that they could use our model, and it's a much simpler, uh, more straightforward and less expensive than using animal models. It's a, a way to use our model that they could use to look for all kinds of therapies. But the second thing we'd like to do is also is, is to build this model out of stem cells and see, actually, can we use this model to understand how we could rebuild the circuits? These are naturally occurring proteins that are in all of our brains that act a bit like baby bio being put on your tomatoes. What they do is they cause brain cells to sprout and regenerate. So there are all kinds of stem cells out there. You can take out these blue cells, put them in a dish, and they make these little colonies. Here's one growing here. This is one we've grown in the lab. We can make lots of them, so we could treat lots and lots of people with these cells. <laughs>